Hello. I'm Jennifer Elliott. I'm the coordinator for curriculum and pedagogy in the School of Public Health at the University of North Carolina. I'm also an assistant professor in public health leadership. I come from a background of education, however, and uh, my research interest is in how people learn with technology, and specifically games, simulations, and augmented and virtual reality. So you might wonder, how does a girl from Virginia wind up with a partner here who's a physician talking about virtual reality? Well, we have complex problems facing us today, and training our students and public health workers requires them to be complex problem solvers. So we're thinking about how to use virtual reality as a solution to that. But what we want to, what we want to talk to you first about today is uh, what the problem is. Um, our public health workers are uh, largely faced with training situations that are process-based or procedurally based. And it leaves them inadequately prepared to deal um, uh, emotionally and professionally with some of the things that they face in complex emergencies. It's my pleasure now to introduce to you Dilshad Jaff. And uh, Dilshad has been working in the field for many years and has firsthand experience about the disconnect between training and reality in complex emergencies. Thank you so much. And I'd like to share my experience briefly about what I faced in reality for 15 years. I am an MD from Iraq, and I'm Kurdish from the disputed areas in Iraq where all we have, the old problems, unfortunately, until now. And I was working in that area and being involved in some of the conflicts in the region for 13 years before doing my master at the UNC and being hired now and acting as a research advisor on complex emergencies with the Gillings Global Gateway. So uh, today I will not talk about what I faced, the 13 years and other issues, but I will be more focused on the training and the preparedness which they are very important, but most of the time we are missing these two important parts. The trainings are not so effective, and the preparedness is even not, sometimes we don't have it. During the 13 years, uh, just this is personal, it was very important for me to meet victims of complex emergencies firsthand. I was not meeting with refugees in Europe or in refugee camps or in other countries. Because I worked with the ICRC, the International Committee of the Red Cross, and under the Geneva Conventions, we had access to conflict zones where others couldn't access. So we were deployed right during the conflict, dealing with victims firsthand, dealing with victims traumatized physically and mentally. Coming back to my topic, the training topic, this is the place where I trained. This is a photo I took as a physician and later on. So you can see it's sophisticated, many cams and other equipment, but when I went into the field, this is the place where I worked in. A very old building, the staff of that health center, they couldn't even stay in during the winter time because of the rain, and they were afraid that this building might collapse on them at any moment. This is an ER in a town covering 50,000 population. And in this town, they have explosions and attacks almost on a daily basis. As an average, they have 10 wounded people every day. And they should deal with, treat, rescue, and then they send them to the nearest hospital. And this is what only they have, a sphygmomanometer, a stethoscope, and few beds, which is even, it's, it's not a proper bed for patients. Hygiene, infection control, waste management, as a physician, you hear about it a lot when you do your studies, and it's very important, it's crucial, and you should do it. You should wash your hands with gloves, running water, and all of that. But I just wanted to show this is an ER from another place where no running water, and this is the basin, unfortunately. So when you used to wash your hand, and when you used to think about hygiene seriously and do infection control and when you work in these settings welcome to the reality infection control sharks everywhere incinerators are not working 
almost everywhere. And this is not in only in armed conflict zones during the Ebola, other settings in most of the developing countries, the incinerators are not working, and the concept of waste management is missing. This is a real, yeah, sorry. Next slide. This is a real place. I was, I was locked in for 20 days, and I was trained in that place to be a humanitarian. This is in Europe, and uh, I stayed locked in in that place for 20 days, getting lectures and presentations about outbreaks, uh, victims of armed conflicts, other skills. And when I went into the field, this is the reality. This area is out of control. No, any government is controlling that area. And it's unsafe, and you might get attacked at any moment. And you deal with people, those people, they were displaced just last night, and we got the information. We went there, and we tried to, to do our best. This is an account for internal, internally displaced people. And again, this region is out of control. Nobody is controlling this region. It's unsafe, and many bad things are happening all the time. And we needed to function there. So for me, this place where I was locked in, and this place where I was functioning, the disconnection and the gap was so clear, obvious. Next one. And when you use, when you join an organization, first of all, you Google them up, you look them up, and if you don't know them, and you think that you will be using the same stuff others are using, so these are the cars, we get special trainings on land cruisers, how you try, what you do, all these logos for protection, and the communication devices, but guess what? We are the first victims in those settings. We come under fire, the medical mission and the humanitarians. So this is the result, and we know that the conflict is evolving and changing every day. Now we don't have armies fighting. We have people divided by ethnicities, religion, sex, etc. So we are the first victim. And due to that, we were not even able to use the logo Red Cross logo or our cars. We needed to go low profile and we needed to use local taxis, local cars. And I remember the first time when I was hired, the first day of my orientation or briefing before going into the field, I was told, be friendly, be polite at checkpoints because they are human also. I said, oh, really? Okay. And down your window slowly, be confident, and don't forget to remove your sunglasses before reaching any checkpoint. These were the only advices I got. And I was sent by this car into dangerous places. And they forgot to tell me, don't wear seatbelts. Because when I put it on, the taxi driver just told me, after like 30 minutes, he was looking at me. And I was like kind of weird. And he said, you know, uh, just remove your seatbelt because you look so foreign here. And you will come more under fire. So even the seatbelt I was not allowed to use, and nobody told me about that. Next. These are all the communication devices you get training on. You will not use them. Rarely you use them. You get like you spend weeks on those, but... So first time when I went, for sure you have a laptop, you have a backpack, and you have a disk telecommunication device, as you can see, which you need to use to inform the base what's going on, and then you have your phone which has a camera and it's sophisticated. I was not able to use those I went first time with, but it brought me even more under attack, more, I felt even more unsafe with those. I ended up for years going with this basic Nokia phone and this notebook and, and, and pen, for years going into the field, meeting victims and doing interventions. So this is just briefly, I wanted to share some part of the realities, and now Jennifer will continue and we'll take it from there. So as we've heard from Dilshad, there's a, a huge disconnect between what we are, um, how we're training our public health humanitarian workers and the realities that they face. Some of the kinds of things that we need to get to our um, workforce out there are the kinds of skills that aren't easily measured and uh, David and Nick talked a little bit earlier about human-centered design and constructivism. And the idea that um, the kinds of skills we need our humanitarian workers to have are very messy and complex and hard to measure. So what does virtual reality have to do with that? 
So this is a space where we can start to think about recreating uh, environments where complex emergencies might um, be Re- recreated, sorry, and um, where people can experience the kind of high intensity or, uh, for example, having to um, negotiate a border checkpoint while a patient leads out next to you. Um, so putting our students, essentially, uh, in environments that require them to really uh, practice skills that are at a higher level and a little um, harder to measure. So what is this virtual reality? I know you've all heard about it because just in the last month or so, we've uh, seen new hardware come in the market and people are all abuzz about virtual reality. If you can think about reality on one end of the continuum and virtual reality, full immersion on the other, reality is the space we're standing in now. Virtual reality is a full uh, headset where you can't see anything outside of where you are. When we talk about augmented or mixed reality, that's the idea of using something like your camera phone or an iPad to see the environment that's in front of you and then overlaying digital content on that. So what I wanted to talk to you a little bit about is the idea of immersion. And simply creating 3D spaces doesn't create immersion. And if you're able to attend our uh, micro lab later, we'll, we'll have some good examples of uh, what immersion looks like in a, in a low-tech simulation, and uh, what immersion doesn't look like even when you have the highest technology available to you. So you can be psychologically immersed, you can be physically immersed in a space, and then there's social immersion through which you have interactions with others. So what the affordances are of this technology, they lie in the ability to um, as we talked about earlier, constructivism, um, recreate experiences through which students learn. And this is important because we are um, putting our, our humanitarian workers in positions where they have to think quickly, where they have to negotiate, where they have to assess and analyze, and they have to figure out how to find the person in this community who can get them what they need. So these kinds of skills are very different from, from what we're currently training for. So some of the things that virtual reality uh, can do well in the recent research is showing this um, is actually reducing racial bias, uh, developing cultural competency, uh, creating empathy, and also it's being used for uh, mental health treatment. Some of the work um, that's been done with racial bias is um, done by Mel Slater at the University of Barcelona. And this work has demonstrated that by simply embodying someone of another race, you can reduce your implicit racial bias index score. So this is pretty powerful when we think about the the kinds of um, situations that we could create for our students um, in helping them develop cultural competency and uh, even cultural humility. The other work I wanted to talk to you about is that of uh, Skip Rizzo out of the University of Southern California. And uh, this work is using virtual reality to treat um, PTSD. And this work is involving the use of uh, virtual reality for cognitive behavioral therapy. There's also uh, some recent studies that are demonstrating cognitive behavioral therapy and virtual reality for the use of treating depression in teens. So uh, we have a a lot of opportunities there, not only to think about preparing our public humanitarian workforce, but also caring for their mental health, preparing them for um, complex emergencies mentally, and then providing support for them upon their return. Currently, there aren't a lot of people who are willing to go into these zones. So we can't afford to lose them early by having them inadequately trained. Um, And we can't afford to send them home broken and unwilling to return on missions. I'm not looking. So this was was, um, a really, really, really really brief overview of the uh, research behind what we can do with immersive learning environments and the reason that this is a good choice for helping us train our public health workforce. 
I hope that you've been able to sign up for our micro lab. Um, during that time, you'll get an opportunity to experience some of this technology firsthand. And if you don't get to do it during the micro lab, I hope you'll follow up with any of us who are part of that um, and or find a way to try it on yourself. It's the kind of thing you can't really understand until you experience it yourself. And, Dilshan? Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Thank you.